and I work at the MoTeC Research and Development Centre in Melbourne, Australia. Today's webinar is entitled, How to Set Up CAN Messaging in a PDM. Now we're going to cover a, a number of topics today, all of which relate to getting the most flexibility out of your PDM. Uh, it's preferable if you have seen our other webinars on PDMs so that you're familiar with the overall operation of a PDM. And today we're just going to be talking specifically about CAN messaging. So uh, I would suggest if you haven't looked at our other webinars first, you might like to do that before you uh, view this one. So we're going to cover in, in order, we're going to cover CAN basics for PDMs. Um, just basically, we're not going to go over the entire description of how CAN messaging works. Uh, we assume that you already are familiar with that. Uh, within the PDM uh, Manager program, we're going to look at the global setup for CAN inputs and just have a quick uh, description of how you need to set that. Uh, then we're going to describe the various CAN output messaging and how the options can be set. Uh, thirdly, we're going to describe the uh, somewhat peculiar way that PDM mathematics works. Uh, it's very important that you understand this so that you can interface with other devices. And then the last thing we're going to do is a step-by-step -step description of how to connect a number of our other MoTeC devices to a PDM. So we'll be looking at getting M800 data into a PDM, uh, also dash type data, that is either an ADL or an SDL into a PDM. And then we're going to look at how to get PDM data back into a dash, which is a, a different issue. And finally, we're going to look at uh, how we can go from one PDM to another, which is quite a common application in a lot of race cars. So it's a reasonably comprehensive uh, webinar and will be it may take some time and you may wish to skip forward if you're looking at this replay to the particular area that you're interested in. Okay, so this is just a diagram of the typical use of a PDM uh, within a vehicle. And it shows what we're looking at here is the, 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 the sort of MoTeC devices you may see in a system and then how they might interact with a PDM. Of course, the PDM's design is to control uh, power distribution and therefore it's, it's used to control things like starter motors, fuel pumps, wipers, lights and other such output devices. It also has the capability of monitoring input devices such as switches or voltages and finally it has the ability to exchange messaging via the CAN bus. Um, and in this way we can use other devices such as an M800 or a DASH to generate our control signalling and the PDM can respond to those messages on the CAN bus and operate such things as fuel pumps and starter motors. Uh, so the objective here, of course, is that we can simplify our wiring and we can also decentralise our wiring so that, uh, for example, uh, the PDM is located uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the devices it needs to operate and then it is simply connected to the ECU or to other control devices by means of the CAN bus. Um, this, of course, vastly simplifies the sort of wiring that you'll need in a vehicle as uh, you can mainly distribute power and CAN signalling through the vehicle and then you can have your specific hardwired sensors uh, local to each of these devices. Now, you'll see on the right-hand side of this diagram, we're also uh, showing our UTC device uh, which goes via a USB cable to our laptop and that's how we talk to these uh, various MoTeC devices on the CAN bus. So if you don't have a UTC device, you'll need to have one to uh, use these manager programs with the PDM and the ECU. Now input messages on, on PDMs uh, can, take, can take a number of forms. Essentially what we're doing is we're using an input message in the same way we would as a, as a physical input pin. So we can name these input messages in the same way as we can, uh, an input pin, um, and that means that they're, functionally they're interchangeable in how you do your PDM programming. And typically you can just give it a simple uh, name or you can use a tree hierarchy. Now we tend to group things together uh, and therefore by separating them, the names with a dot we can uh, group a number of devices or a number of inputs or outputs into one group such as engine or body um, and as you can see we've got an example there of engine.rpm uh, or body.lights.highbeam. So this input channel naming is uh, very flexible and it allows you to functionally group things together even if they're not actually physically or logically grouped together. Um, for example your engine RPM might be coming in as a CAN channel from another device like an M800 uh, whereas another engine channel might be 
close to the PDM, such as a fuel pump. Uh, but they can all be grouped under the engine group, and that way you can functionally group things rather than where they're physically located or which device they're connected to. So the CAN inputs, uh, they're, they're somewhat restricted with the PDM, but the, the objective here is that you can uh, still uh, acquire information from any of our other devices. Now, the way we use our CAN inputs is that they have uh, a base address. Uh, in this example, we've got uh, 118 hexadecimal, and then it uses the three addresses after that. So you have four CAN address channels available, and the base address must be a multiple of four. For example, 110 or 114 or 118. Uh, the PDMs are not capable of compound messaging. Uh, they must, uh, they can only receive what we call sequential res, uh, messages, which is a message where each of the eight data bytes uh, is a is a channel name, uh, a channel value, and uh, you can't use compa compound indexing. Okay, so that just means that in in the case of the transmit device, uh, it must be set to produce the right type of messaging for the PDM. And we will go through that later with each of these individual devices. Now, input channels can be 8-bit or 16-bit. Uh, the way the PDM mathematics works is purely in an 8-bit form. So therefore, if you bring in a 16-bit channel, uh, it needs to be divided to give you a, uh, an 8-bit number, which is in the range of 0 to 255. Uh, now, any number that divides down to a larger than 255 is just simply chopped off as a 255. Okay, now this, what this means is that there are some limitations, but if, as long as you understand this mathematical uh, structure, which we will explain a bit, little bit further, then you can, you can bring virtually any type of uh, CAN channel in and still get sensible results from it. Now the other thing we can do with uh, the CAN inputs is we can allow bit masking, and this allows us to select only specific uh, bits out of an 8-bit uh, data byte, and this is typically used for status information um, a good example would be an M800 error message, where each bit in the eight bits uh, is, is signifies a particular M800 error, for example, a uh, manifold pressure error. And so we can uh, take the error message from an M800 and we can split it into the individual uh, error statuses by using bit masking with multiple messages. Now finally, our, our CAN receive channels have a timeout and this is so that if you, for some reason, lose your CAN uh, bus or your CAN, there's a clash with CAN data, the PDM knows which way to respond. Uh, the, the two options are simply that you hold the, the previous message or you default back to a, a number such as zero. And this is pretty uh, important uh, so that you don't have a PDM effectively uh, making decisions based on faulty data. Okay, so now we're looking at the PDM manager screen that is used to set up our CAN inputs. Um, this is basically what we've just described in our previous screen. So what we're looking at here is the full screen grab of the PDM manager program. Uh, we're using version 1.5 at the moment, and so I suggest that if you need to use a PDM, you should download the current firmware version and, uh, and PDM manager software from our website. And that way, what you see on screen will match exactly what I'm showing you on the screen here. So what we've done here is we've clicked on our global setup, uh, which is over here. And then uh, that gives us a screen which has these three parameters, PDM, CAN inputs, and output pins. So if I double click on this CAN input uh, entry here, that opens up my global setup uh, dialog box here. OK, now what we're looking at again is we need to set our input base address. And so that's been set at 118 hexadecimal. Now you can use any CAN address you like, um, but as in many MoTeC devices, there are conventions that we use that make it a lot easier for us to, uh, to interact between different devices. So let's just suggest that you use 118 as a, as a sensible address, and that way you can set up other devices uh, with the same messaging, and that's how our example is going to work in, in the uh, later stages of this webinar. Now, so as we mentioned, there are four input messages, or there are, you can have four consecutive CAN addresses, and you can set a timeout for each of these CAN addresses separately. Uh, in practice, there's not really much point in having different timeouts. Uh, the main thing is to use the timeouts as a tool to avoid uh, letting the PDM make bad decisions based on incorrect data. 
Now, as is common with a lot of uh, terminology with uh, hexadecimal mathematics, the first message is actually called message zero, and so the second message is called message one. Um, not particularly troublesome, but just something to bear in mind. There are actually four messages, but they're called message zero to message three. So for us to receive any CAN inputs, these are the things we must set up. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and once we've done this, we can move to looking at the output setup. So now, again, PDMs have a number of options here for how the CAN transmit messages can be uh, used. Firstly, there's a standard message format. And what that allows us to do is transmit. Uh, there are some other devices uh, which have this as a standard uh, template. And so this transmits a standard bunch of messages uh, at 20 hertz. Uh, you can again, you can set any base address you like, but we we tend to use uh, 500 hexadecimal because uh, our other templates are set up with 500 hexadecimal. So you can therefore quickly make a connection from two different devices. Now these messages are transmitted as compound messages, and there are six of them, and they can individually be selected or deselected. So what those messages cover are our input statuses, our input voltages, our output currents, our output voltages, our output statuses, and our output loads. And in addition, the input uh, status message includes basic information about the PDM, such as battery voltage and internal temperature, just other monitoring uh, information that you might like to see. So these, these messages can be selected individually. Um, whether you need all of them is a question of what you're trying to do with your other devices. Um, however, if you're using these messages, for example, to log information, it's well worth logging most of these messages. And as I said, these messages are uh, a template type of message, which means if you have uh, many of our other devices, like a, a dash logger, uh, uh, an SDL, ADL2, ADL3 or an SDL3, you can just simply open these templates up and you'll get these, uh, this data automatically pre-configured. And I am going to show you how to do that a little bit later. Now, there aren't any templates available for uh, the original ADL or for our M800. So in these cases, uh, you need to do a little bit more uh, a little bit more work to get the data into those devices. However, there is a second option for our CAN transmit, and that is to have user-defined messages. And in this case, you can basically set these messages up any in any fashion that you like. Uh, these, therefore, uh, are all that these are not compound messages these are sequential messages but they can have any address um, so you can use this in a very flexible fashion to either send data to an m800 or to an adl if you see uh, if you see a particular reason for that so now we're looking at the pdm manager screen that allows us to uh, set up the standard messaging uh, so just again what we need to do here is we are in the pdm program Firstly, we click on our CAN outputs uh, option here on the left-hand side. And then if I click on the standard messages uh, selection here, that'll bring up this dialog box that you can see. So what we're seeing here is all of these checkboxes have been ticked, and that means that we're transmitting each of these messages. Now, just for an example, that first message there, input state and diagnostics, this is the one that's transmitted on CAN address 500. Um, but that, of course, depends on you having set your base address. So the base address below is what defines where these messages appear uh, in terms of addressing. First address, uh, 500, is the one that defines the input state and diagnostics message. Then the other messages follow in, in order after that. Now these messages are transmitted at 20 hertz, which makes them quite useful for data logging and such like. Um, and in most cases, they're fast enough for other decisions to be made as well. Um, if for some reason you need to make decisions quicker, then you'd need to use one of the other messages, which you can see up here. Uh, again, they're called message 0 and 1 and message 2 and message 3. Uh, now you can actually set, select different uh, transmit rates for these messages. So these are the custom messages. Uh, actually, I would tell a lie there, they're actually transmitted at 50 hertz, which means it's quicker than the standard messages uh, and certainly fast enough for most decision-making type of messaging that you might use in other devices. So now we're looking at a, a custom message zero, and you can see each of these channels, uh, what, what these messages allow you is eight individual channels from the PDM. As we said earlier, the PDM channels are 8-bit channels, so you can, in one CAN message, you can fit eight bytes of information. 
Um, so you simply uh, open that dialog, click on this right hand box here, and then you can select uh, whatever the available channels are to be transmitted. Now again down the bottom you have an address and in this case you can select any address. Uh, there is no limitation on whether they're uh, sequential addresses and they, can, they don't need to be adjacent addresses. So uh, you can generate addressing that may be specific, for example, uh, for an OE type of installation where you need to send certain data at pre-existing addresses. Now, as we mentioned, a PDM operates as a, an 8-bit uh, mathematical engine, if you like, and therefore uh, any data that we need to process within the PDM resides in the form of an 8-bit number. And so if you're bringing in CAN channels, which are 16-bit numbers, they need to be divided so that they produce an 8-bit number. And again, as I mentioned, if you have a 16-bit number, which is divided uh, and it produces a result that's greater than 255, the PDM is simply going to call that 255. So it's quite possible that you can lose uh, some of your data range if you don't select a useful divider. Now, the other thing you must remember is that many of the CAN channels that are sent, uh, for example, from an M800, they include uh, the decimal places uh, in the message. And so a number such as 100% throttle isn't actually transmitted as simply as a 100. It's usually transmitted as a 1000 because there's one decimal place. Uh, if, if you haven't uh, got this sort of clear in mind, I'll just quickly explain it. But, but we do cover this to some extent in our uh, our what is CAN webinar, and if you have some confusion there, you might want to take a look at that. So essentially, what we have is there are there are uh, tr the normal CAN messaging, of course, doesn't know uh, anything about decimal places, and so both the transmitting and the receiving device need to be set to match this data up. Uh, typically, a number such as uh, RPM uh, is usually transmitted just as a single integer. So, for example, an M800 RPM transmission uh, that for example, with 3,450 RPM, the raw CAN number that gets put onto the CAN bus, which was, is a 16-bit number, would be 3,450. And then what we would do for the PDM is we would divide that number by 100, and we would get a scaled value of 34. In other words, each integer in the PDM channel represents 100 RPM. So this is, uh, this is a, a way of getting the correct scaling. Clearly, it also reduces the amount of resolution within the PDM, but 100 RPM is usually a sufficient amount of resolution to make decisions, uh, for example, whether the PDM wants to operate starter motors and things like that. Um, you might have a cutoff point of 500 RPM, in which case you'd be setting your PDM channel comparison to 5. Uh, again, this is something that is uh, reasonably obvious once you get used to it, uh, but it just needs some clarification here. And again, a number like an M800 throttle position, uh, this is usually transmitted on the CAN bus with one decimal place. And so if the M800 sees a throttle position of 68.4%, it's actually putting a number of 684 onto the CAN bus, uh, which clearly represents 68.4 uh, with one decimal place. So uh, again, this is a number that's larger than 255. And so if you don't divide it uh, by a sensible number, the PDM is not actually going to be able to resolve your throttle position. Now, in this case, of course, the simple thing to do is divide it by 10, and then you'll get a result, which is the throttle position in percentage without the decimal place. Uh, again, this is usually sufficiently uh, good detail or resolution to make decisions about things like throttle position. Now, the third example we have here is uh, something like our battery voltage in an M800. And in this case, we have two decimal places and so typically something like a battery voltage of 12.56 is transmitted on the CAN bus as 1,256. Once again, um, you could divide this by either 10 or 100. Um, in this case, if we divide it by 10, we get a number of 125. And then again, this, this means we have a range of basically uh, from 0 to 255 in the PDM would equate to 25.5 volts. Um, so that allows us to have a little bit more resolution in the PDM, it's one tenth of a volt per count. Uh, if you were finding this confusing, you can divide that number by 100, and then your result would simply be a 12. Um, if, of course, that may not be enough resolution in terms of battery voltage. So this is something, again, you need to bear in mind. But once you get used to the concept, it's quite straightforward. OK, so now we're going to look at 
uh, a few examples of how we would set up messaging for individual MoTeC devices. Uh, now you'll see we have an arrow here indicating we're, we're getting data from an M800 into a PDM. It's not particularly easy to uh, do the opposite, which is to get, M uh, get PDM data into an M800. It is possible, but it's really a little bit beyond the scope of this webinar, so we're not going to talk about it uh, today. So what we're looking at is how to get M800 data into the PDM, and the simplest way, or the most practical way, is to use a custom data set in the M800. So we're now going to go through step by step how you might do that. Firstly, we'll set up our M800, and we need to go into the M800 ECU manager to do that. And we need to find this particular uh, dialog, and we do that by going and using our adjust system. We go adjust, general setup, communications, set up custom data sets. And you can take this through with either your escape key and your arrow keys, or you can use the mouse to select this. So the first thing we've set up is a custom data set. Now this particular example is just one I've plucked, uh, so it's not necessarily relevant. But having a look, we see we've got engine RPM, throttle position driver, and the engine temperature as our first three messages. So these will be transmitted um, as a custom data set, and we need to set the M800 uh, CAN settings as well, um, so that it knows which type of message transmission to use for this custom data set. So uh, just to remind you that we can't use M800 uh, standard data sets. Uh, the PDM is not capable of receiving those data sets. We must use custom data sets. And we need to use sequential messaging, as I've mentioned earlier. The way the CAN receive works in a PDM is that it needs to use sequential reception. So we've set up our, our channels here, and then we're going to go to uh, the CAN setup page in the M800 ECU manager, and that's what you can see on the screen now. So what we're going to do is transmit custom data set one, in the correct CAN address, which is going to work for our PDM. So we get to this screen uh, in our M800 ECU manager by using Adjust, General Setup, Communications, CAN Setup. And you'll see that on the right. Now, in this case, I've chosen CAN slot 0, which is the first one that I've outlined in red. Uh, but you can use any of the transmit slots. It doesn't really matter. So what we've selected here is CAN 0 data. We've selected number 8. And as you can see down below, that's custom data set 1, sequential. So that's the data set we've just, we've just set up, and that's using sequential transmission. Second thing is we've got our CAN address, which is 280. Now, this is the decibel equivalent of uh, 118 hexadecimal. Uh, we won't go through the description of how these hexadecimal relates to decimal, other than the quickest way for you to make the conversion is to use the normal Windows calculator. You can use the scientific screen there, and you can convert from hexadecimal to decimal very quickly. Just suffice to say that uh, 118 hexadecimal is the same as decimal 280. So in an M800, we need to enter 280. And lastly, we're going to set our transmit rate at 50 hertz. Now, the other thing to check in your M800 is to make sure that your CAN communication speed is set at 1 megabit per second. Uh, this is the default speed for an M800. So unless you've changed it, there should be no uh, need to change it. However, we've just shown this screen so that if you need to, you can check. It's in the Tools menu under Options and Communications. And you can see here we've highlighted it. Uh, the CAN data rate is set to one, mega, 1 megabit. And that's because the PDM devices will only communicate at 1 megabit a second. They won't communicate at 500k. So having done all that, we can now go and take a look at our PDM manager screen. OK, now the first one we're seeing here is simply our blank screen. Um, and what we need to do is we click on our CAN input selection here. And that will open up our CAN input properties uh, screen. Uh, now, what we're doing here is adding channels. So in fact, once you're in the input property screen, you, you right click where I am now with the green arrow. And when you right click, you can add a channel. And then you'll see this CAN input properties dialog. OK, so now what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to add in the channels that we've just created in our M800 custom data set. And the first one we'll call M800.RPM. Now this, again, as we said earlier, we can group our data uh, by using the dot as a separator. So I'm going to have three data uh, channels coming in, which are all going to start with M800. Dot, and that way, when we look over here, uh, when we see our groups of channels, they'll all be grouped together under M800. So we call our channel M800.RPM. The data size is 16-bit, which is the, the way it comes from an M800 in a custom data set. 
we've set our CAN address to 118 hexadecimal. Now our offset is zero, and this, is, uh, this indicates that it's the first of the messages in this custom data set. Now, as we mentioned earlier, because we're using a 16-bit number here, we need to divide it to produce a sensible result for the PDM mathematics. So I've divided our RPM number by 100, and that means that, for example, 3,500 RPM will, will come up as a, as a 35 in the PDM software. And the last thing we need to check here is down below, I've set my CAN message timeout. Uh, you'll recall earlier we showed the, the global input screen for CAN messaging where we've, we've set up our timeout delays. And in this case, uh, as a safety margin, if my CAN messaging fails for some reason, I don't want to hold the previous value. I want the PDM to use a value of zero. And this just allows us to build a little bit of safety into our CAN messaging. So that's our first receive message. Okay, now we've, we've clicked OK on that one and immediately I've added another one which is called throttle position and you can see up here our first message has been, is showing uh, up, in the, up in that screen there. So the throttle position again, it's a 16-bit number, the CAN address is the same. Now in this case the offset is 2, that means we're, it's our second uh, message coming in from the M800 and it's 2 bytes from the start of the message. And as we described earlier, we're going to, describe, we're going to divide this by 10 so that our one decimal place throttle position will come out as simply as a number, which is the percentage of throttle position. Then we go and click OK again. And then lastly, we can enter our M800 engine temperature channel, which was the third one we had in our custom data set. Uh, now, clearly, we can do this on and on. I'm only going to show you these three channels, um, but that's, that's how the messaging works. Now, in this case, the offset is four. Uh, what you have to re recall here is that our offsetting starts from zero, and that because we're adding in 16-bit numbers, each of those numbers takes up two bytes. So it's our third message, and the, the offset of the first message was zero, the second message was two, and this message is four. Again, engine temperature comes in as a one decimal place number, so we'll divide it by 10, and that'll allow us to see uh, you know, the same uh, engine temperature of 86.5 will show in the PDM as 86. So that's our input channel entry from the M800. And that's all we need to do. Now, before we move on to the next one, I should remind you that you've got to save this file and then send it to the PDM before the CAN messaging becomes active. Okay, now the, other, the next thing we're going to look at quickly is how to get uh, ADL data into a PDM. Now, again, we have a number of options with our dashes. Um, the dash transmit messages must be built to suit. It's very similar to the way we've set up the M800. Um, so we, we, we effectively build a CAN uh, message in the ADL, uh, which is sequential. We, again, we make sure that everything's using the same address. And again, we set up our PDM to read those messages. OK, so we're going to use the SDL3 as our example. But any of our Dash Manager programs or any of our later Dash Manager programs have the same uh, basic structure. So you can do this with, with any of them. If you're using an, SD, uh, an original ADL, then uh, the messaging is slightly different. However, uh, the majority of our devices use this, uh, this version of the Dash Manager. OK, so we open up our file in the Dash Manager. Then we click on Connections and Communications. And this will open up our Comms Setup window. First thing we need to do is select an empty CAN slot and click the Advanced button. And that's going to open up uh, this, this screen you can see here, which we've got a, a called CAN4 Comms Setup. So I've selected CAN slot 4. OK, so now there's a fair bit of setup required in, this, uh, in, this, in the uh, Dash Manager. Firstly, we're in our parameters screen. And the things we need to set, we need to set our device to a transmit message. Um, the, some of the defaults are fine, so we'll leave them. We need to set our address format to standard, which is the default. Now we're putting in our base address. Uh, again, our PDM normally would be looking at 118, 119, 11A or 11B. Um, based on a, a base address in the PDM of 118. So we've gonna, we'll, we'll use 118A here just to be slightly different. Again, it doesn't matter as long as you've set your PDM to receive on the same address. And lastly, we've set our transmit rate to 50 hertz. Now, now, now we've defined our message. What we do is we need to define which channels are going to be included in this message. So we click on our transmitted channels tab, which is up here where the green arrow is. And now we can add uh, individual channels to our transmit message. 
So we hit, firstly, we, sh we hit the transmitter channels tab, then we click on the add button and then the select button. And that's what you can see here. And I can do a, a search for a channel I'm after. Uh, I've just chosen engine RPM. Again, we're going to use similar uh, channels to the ones we used with the M800 example. So then I click OK down here. And there you can see engine RPM is selected. Uh, once again, we need to set up our offsets uh, and so forth. And so this is going to be our first, uh, in a first slot, if you like, in this CAN message. So the offset is zero. The length is two. The multiplier uh, can be one or six. Now, the reason I mention this is because uh, ADLs and SDLs have a somewhat odd way of calculating RPM. As you can see here where it says base resolution, they actually use hertz rather than RPM as their basic uh, transmission numbers. And that means that an engine RPM uh, of, say, 5,000 is not actually transmitted as a CAN number of 5,000. It's transmitted in hertz. So the simplest way to resolve that to produce a number that is equivalent to what you might get from an M800 is simply to use a multiplier of 6. And what that means is uh, an engine RPM of 5,000 will produce a CAN number of 5,000. Um, so just this is worth uh, bearing in mind in most uses with ADLs and SDLs. A slightly uh, odd little bit of mathematics there. So we put our multiplier of six, which is uh, not what we're seeing in the screen, but that's what we'd be using. And our divider, our divisor, and our adder uh, should be one and zero. In fact, I'm wrong here on the left. That should actually be a zero. Then we click on the OK button. Okay. So now what we can see is our engine RPM. Is that's the first channel we've created, and that'll be in the first part of that CAN message. So uh, again, on your left, you can see the message type is set to single. That, again, is quite important. We can't use compound messaging um, for a PDM. So we must make sure we've selected single. Okay, now what we would do is we would add, uh, by clicking on the Add button here, we can add extra channels to this CAN message. Uh, I'm not going to go through that, but that's effectively the same process as we would do with an M800. And the last thing you need to do uh, in the STL Manager, you need to save this. Uh, by clicking on the Save As button. Now, this what this does is save this particular message and it shows up in the next screen uh, when you look at your CAN messaging slots. Now, if you don't give this message a name, it'll just show up as blank, even though there are some messages there. So we normally click on this button, uh, give the message a name, such as PDM Transmit uh, Message 1 or something like that. And that way, when you're looking in your normal uh, ADL or SDL messaging screen, you're going to see that message named. So in this case, I've called it PDM Webinar SDL Transmit. Uh, and the other, as I said, if you haven't named it, it's actually going to have the messaging there, but you won't see it uh, listed in these slots here. So that shows on the left, we've got the name of the message, and on the right, we're seeing which channels are being transmitted. So then, of course, we can click on the OK button here, and then in our main SDL screen, firstly, we need to save the file, and secondly, we need to send the file to the dash. As you know, if you haven't sent these files, then the dash still doesn't have this information and it's not going to give you your CAN transmission. Okay, so now we look at how to receive these messages in the PDM manager. Now, firstly, of course, um, this is effectively the same setup as we would use for our M800 receive. Um, in fact, you can see over here on the right hand side, I've still got that M800 group here. Um, and that because we used a dot separator, we have an M800 followed by the, the three names of the channels that we uh, put in earlier. Okay, so we've gone back to our global setup screen. We're setting up our CAN inputs. Uh, once again, we're using making sure our base address is set where we need it to be. And we're also, um, yeah, we're just setting our timeouts and so forth. So this, this is something we need to do for each, uh, each of the devices we need to connect in. All right, now in the in the CAN inputs here, we've got an empty screen, so I'm going to right click on this uh, in this area here and click on the Add Channel button, and then I'm going to be able to bring in my SDL3 channels. So this is basically the same as we set for our uh, for our M800 receive. Now I've decided, uh, of course, it's an SDL. I'm going to call this SDL3.RPM, uh, similar to what we did with the M800. Once again, we've got a 16-bit uh, data size. Uh, you recall we set our CAN transmit address in the STL to 11A, just to differentiate it from the M800 of 118. Uh, the offset is 0, the divisor is 100. So this is pretty much the way we do it with the M800. 
and then when we click on the OK button, that's going to save that channel. And there it is, showed up as the STL3.RPM, and it's showing up over here in this group as STL3 as well. If I click on my little plus button here, then it'll show whatever's in that STL3 group, which in this case is just the RPM message. So that's pretty straightforward as well. Now, of course, you do have to save this file, so we're clicking on this Save File button here, and then you also have to send this to the PDM as well. Uh, the same, same as the operation with an, a, with an ADL or an STL. If you haven't sent the configuration to the device, it's not going to do what you've asked it to do. Okay, now the next thing we're going to have a quick look at is how to get data from a PDM into a dash. This is a little bit easier uh, than the, the, the reverse because PDMs have these standard messages and the, these templates can be just simply brought into SDLs, ADL2s, ADL3s and SDL3s. Uh, again, you can't do this with an M800 uh, and you can't do it with an, with an original ADL, but all of the other dashes uh, just have it as a standard message. As usual, we have to make sure we select uh, the same address in both devices. And in this case, our MoTeC convention is to use 500 hexadecimal. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll have a look in our dash manager. Uh, now, in this case, we're setting up a can receive message. And because we've got a template, it's quite simple, in fact. So in our dash manager program, we click on connections and communications. We select an empty CAN slot, uh, so I'll just show you, for example, I would click here on CAN2, then we click the select button. Now, the, in our previous example, we were clicking the advanced button. In this case, we click the select button, and this allows us to select a predefined template. So what I'm doing is I, I scroll down by using the scroll bar here, and here we can see our PDM uh, messages, the predefined messages. So that first message is PDM input state and diagnostic. I just I can click that and, and whatever other PDM messages I need. Click the OK button here. And then when I click OK, that's going to appear in this CAN slot. Now, because each of these PDM messages is a compound message, it also has a, they also have individual addresses. So each of these message types from the PDM requires an individual CAN slot. But as you can see, we have many empty CAN slots, so that's not an issue. So again, I'll just click when I click on the OK button here. I'm going to see my PDM input state and diag here. And then on the right hand side, uh, there's a very long list of all of these different uh, messages, uh, data parameters that are contained in that PDM input state message. And because it's a compound message, you can see it's got quite a lot of data in it. So we don't necessarily need to see all of this and we can check or uncheck which of these uh, data messages we need to look at within the ADL or the SDL. Now, you might uh, think this is a little unnecessary, but in many cases, people bring in these templates and they don't check which of these buttons have been checked, and therefore they can't see their data in the PD, in the SDL, um, and they, they are a little bit baffled why that's the case. But in some cases, you need to scroll down using the scroll bar, find the particular channel you're looking for, and make sure that it has actually been checked. So you check all of these off, you click OK, and once again, you must make sure you save the file and send that to the SDL. Okay, so now we're going to look at how we use the PDM manager to transmit these standard messages. So the first thing we do is we go to our CAN outputs uh, selection on the left hand side, and then I double click on the standard messages thing here, and that's what opens this dialog box for standard messages. As you can see, I've selected the same base address, which is 500 hexadecimal, which is the default address anyway. All right, so now we, in this case, we've selected each of these messages to be transmitted. Um, it's a question of which data you need to see in your dash, but if you need all of it, then there's plenty of room on the CAN bus. You may as well have them all turned on. Um, that's pretty straightforward. It's actually quite easy to set up these standard message templates in the PDM Manager. So then you click OK, and of course, you have to save the file and then send it to the PDM. All right, now our final example, uh, which is probably the uh, one that comes up quite a lot, is where we have a vehicle where we have multiple PDMs installed. Uh, this is typically the case in race cars that have a, a front PDM and a rear PDM, uh, where we've isolated um, you know, things that are local to the PDM so we can minimize the amount of uh, dense wiring in the car. We can simply have power bus wiring, which is a heavy gauge wire, and we can have CAN bus wiring, which can be a light gauge wire, and then each of the devices that's local to the PDM can have its heavier gauge wire 
as appropriate. The most common uh, example of this would be a front PDM, which would be in the vicinity of the engine computer or the dash, and that may frequently have such things as the light switches, the pump switches, and those things going into it. And then we need that front PDM to transmit the switch status information to the rear PDM, which may be what actually controls such things as the fuel pumps, lift pumps, uh, and various lights, such as a rain light. So in this case, we're using one PDM to collect our control information, and then we're using the other PDM, which has the devices attached to it, to do the actual switching on and off. And as you can see, that means you can vastly simplify uh, how the vehicle is wired. And secondly, we can use such things as light switches uh, in multiple modes, because a light switch into a PDM can be used as a trigger for various other functions as well. Okay, so a couple of things that are worth noting in this case. Firstly, uh, if you're transmitting from one PDM to another, they, they still need to have matching uh, transmit and receive addresses, but you, it's best not to use the addresses in the range 500 hexadecimal to 51F. Uh, these are the ranges that are used for the standard transmit message that we showed just earlier uh, when we're commuting, communicating with an ADL. So uh, although you can use these addresses, it can cause you some form of address clashing if you've got other devices that, that are using this range, so better to avoid those ranges. So if, for example, you might use one PDM starting at 520 hex and the other one starting at 530 hex, and that way they're in a clear address space and they're, they're not going to clash with anything else that's uh, on, the, on the CAN bus. Now, the, uh, what that means is, of course, the two PDMs have got totally different applications. Um, so that's why the PDM configuration file includes the serial number of the device. And that means that when you connect into the CAN bus on your car, you're only sending uh, the right configuration, for example, to the front PDM, and then the right configuration to the rear PDM. And the serial number is a simple way of ensuring that you don't cross these messages over. So we're just going to show a simple example here. Let's say we've put our fuel pump switch from the dash uh, straight to the front PDM. And then we're going to transmit that on the CAN bus and we're going to receive it on the rear PDM and use that to operate our fuel pump output. So the first thing we're doing here um, is to set up an actual switch input. Uh, we haven't shown too many of these in this webinar because we're concentrating on CAN, but we need to see it here. So we click here on our input pins uh, selection on the left and that opens up our list here of input pins. Okay, so we just double click on an empty one and that gives us our input pin properties box. Um, so what I've done is I've called this pin, this uh, this input pin panel for the dash panel dot fuel pump switch. Uh, I've actually added four different switches in here. Uh, just for example, they're not critical, but it's just an example of how we might use this grouping. So I've got a start button, a lift pump switch, a fuel pump switch, and a light switch. Now these are just normal switches that ground uh, ground a switch channel to ground. So all of these default settings here can be used without any real uh, real complications, that's quite straightforward. So that's our, that's our input switch definition. We click, click on OK and then we need to set up our uh, CAN transmit. So in this case what I've gone to is I've gone to the CAN outputs selection on the left and then I'm using message 0. So I double click here on message 0 and that opens up my properties for that first message. So I've added in by clicking on this uh, selection panel here. I can add in each of these buttons and switches that I've selected, that I've created as physical inputs into the input pins, and they're going to be transmitted on the CAN bus from uh, the first, second, and third, and fourth uh, positions in that message. And down below, you can see I've selected 520. That's my transmit message address. OK, so that's our front PDM. We just click on OK here. And then we'll be able to go to our, uh, of course, we need to save this file and send it to the PDM. And then we'll go to our rear PDM. And uh, we're going to do the opposite here. Firstly, we're going to receive our CAN channel, which has that, uh, that defined switch. And then we're going to make it control our output. So firstly, we click here on our CAN input selection. Um, then over here, I, I, I right click in the empty screen and I select add uh, CAN input. And then I've got this CAN input selection uh, dialog here. So we're going to call our uh, channel PDM front. That just defines it so we know we're not looking at a, a direct channel that's coming into our rear PDM. PDM front dot fuel pump switch, uh, which is uh, the same as our panel dot fuel pump switch was in the front PDM. 
Okay, so now in this case it comes as an 8-bit uh, message. It, the CAN address is 520. The offset was 3. That means it was the third uh, third message out of the, the third byte of those messages that you saw earlier. Sorry, I beg your pardon, it's the fourth byte. And the bit mask is FF, which just means we use the entire message. Okay, so that brings our, our fuel pump switch into the rear PDM. Once again, we click on OK, we save our file. Uh, but before we send it to the PDM, we need to add the output pin control. So the last thing we do, we go to our outputs pins uh, selection here in the PDM. Click that, uh, that'll open up your output pin screen here. I've just double clicked in, in this example on that first pin. So that's output pin one. And then we have our properties selection here. So I've called this channel fuel pump drive. And that's actually our, our output to drive the fuel pump. Um, and then down below, we've selected uh, the output is active when the following is true. Now, in this case, we're just making it work straight off the switch. We're not looking at any time delays or anything else. So we just simply say when this channel is active, it's going to turn on the fuel pump. And of course, we select our channel here. We click on this select box here, and that'll allow us to select this channel we've previously entered, which is PDM front dot fuel pump switch. And again, you'll be able to see this on the right hand side, uh, our group of uh, channels coming in as PDM front. So you can see here the usefulness of using this dot as a separator. It allows us to bring in everything from the PDM, the front PDM, and then isolate them down and show, uh, it shows the origination of where the signal is coming from. So then I just click again on the OK button, save my file and send it to the PDM. And that means we've got our PDM to PDM link and we can uh, make the device on the front control the device on the rear. All right, now with all of these applications, it's very useful to be able to see what's actually going on. So the last thing we're going to do is just quickly have a look at the, uh, the monitor channel. Uh, you can see there's a little icon up here if you're connected to the PDM. Uh, regardless of which of these lower screens you're in, you can just click on that monitor channel button or you can hit Control-P on the keyboard and it'll open this monitor PDM box. Uh, there are two boxes. There's a separate one there, uh, which I find a little bit less useful. So I think the control P one is the one you'll find most beneficial. And what it's showing is basically everything that's going on in the PDM. So we can see here we've got our input pins, uh, output pins. Uh, over here is our PDM status, which just shows our general uh, running data of how much current's going through the device and how our battery voltage is looking. And then here what we're looking at is our, is our CAN input channels. And so you see here we've got m800.rpm and our value is 54. Now what that of course would mean is 5400 RPM because of our divider and the way our PDM mathematics is working. Um, and the same would apply to our throttle position. That may be 34.5 degrees, but we divided that CAN number by 10. So we're just seeing our 34 degrees. So this is a very convenient way to, to uh, confirm once that you've put in your CAN messaging that actually the, the uh, behavior of the device is what you'd expect. And you can, of course, run uh, engines up and down or send different messages from your dashes and make sure that you're getting correlating values here in your monitor screen. So this is a very useful tool just for confirming that you have set up your messaging correctly and also to make sure that you've actually sent the configuration uh, to your various devices. OK, well, that takes us to the end of this webinar. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming and uh, having a listen. Hope we haven't gone too fast, but you can always replay these webinars from our website and you can spool backwards and forwards and you can select which information you'd like to see. Um, we did go through this step by step because we think it's very useful uh, just to show exactly which steps are required. Uh, now, of course, there's lots of other information on our webinars. You can go to our website at that address and you can select any of our webinars. We archive all of our webinars. And, and also we have web forums uh, which have particular topics um, and devices. So you can look at uh, topics on M800s or dashes or PDMs. And it's a very useful forum. Uh, you can interact with other users. And also our MoTeX support staff keep a constant eye on the forums as well. And so if there are particularly tricky uh, questions, we can often resolve them for you. Um, but in some cases, you'll find some of our other dealers or other users are also uh, contributing. So the forums are very useful as well. Okay, that's the end of this webinar. Thanks again for attending.